to the over to the great Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so, I want to thank everybody again because the response to this particular event was amazing. Um, it was it was through the roof. We broke records in terms of uh, responses uh, for Be Connected. So we reached uh, an astronomical level of people reached through this event. We also uh, reached an astronomical level of responses to the event. So thank you so much. We are going to transition into the next part. So before I do that, I want to just thank Tracy Walker, who's over here hanging out and socializing. Tracy, Tracy has been documenting uh, the events for uh, the Black Panther series for ABC 11 Community Influencers. So she's over there hanging out. Thank you for being here, thank you for your support. <laughs> Tracy will also be a part of the, another panel that we're gonna be having uh, for Women of Wakanda uh, with some of the alumni here. I haven't talked to them about it yet, y'all. <laughs> Surprise! And Charlie Rocket, who is a cosplay artist. Woo! They will be giving some style advice at Ngozi Design. So the event is on Facebook already. It's not an event page, but it is on Eventbrite. It's called Women of Wakanda 2, and that's T-O-O, -O, Wine with Ngozi Design. There is a cost associated with it, but that cost you know, takes care of what you are going to partake in for that evening, and it's gonna be delicious. And you'll get style advice for the opportunity to prepare your outfit for next year's launch of an annual Black Panther viewing right here in Durham. And that's all I can say about that right now. But it's gonna be big. And you're gonna wear, you're gonna want to have a really fly um, outfit, and you have a whole year to prepare for it. A lot of organizations are coming together to make this happen, and we want to make this an annual thing and set the tone for other cities to have annual celebrations of the Black Panther movie. So. Y'all go to Ngozi on March 20th and go check out that event at Be Connected. Actually, Be Connected Durham on Facebook. The website is going to be ready soon. All right, here we go. So, uh, just one more reminder: cocktails, the the heart shaped herb or the heart shaped herb, depending on how you pronounce it, and also the Wakanda Sunset are available at the bar. Joy Workings is doing the tarot readings over in the corner. A portion of proceeds do go to fund the Be Connected Honorarium Artist Fund. So please uh, go and, and find some, something out about yourself. And then we're going to get started. So each of these panelists have been chosen for a reason. We have an artist, we have an activist and we have writers, and we have documentarians, and we have people who do things from various mediums. And each of these people do a little bit of all the things I just mentioned. So the first thing I want to do is start out with a question, uh, kind of a general question. I'll be asking some things that are a little more specific. But first, I wanna know from each of you, we're gonna pass the mic for this event. This is a pass the mic type of event, you know. Um, what part of the movie was most ins inspirational, and then what was most problematic for you? Okay, um, starting off, hi everyone, my name is Dare Coulter, thank you all for being here. Um, I'll start with most problematic, um, and I will say that Kill Killmonger's death um, was actually problematic for me. I was frustrated by the entire situation surrounding him because um, in life, there are a lot of things where we get upset, you know, there are things we hold on to, things that, that make us mad, but sometimes those things end, us hold, end up holding us back. So, um, Killmonger, I don't think that what he wanted was really super far away from what Nakia was interested in. I think they were different sides of the same coin, so 
um, my extreme difficulty and actually leaving the movie I felt sad about it was the fact that he died because I think if he hadn't been so bent on vengeance you know if that wasn't in his soul so heavily that he could have been a really great thing for Wakanda so he had the opportunity he's like well we can save you he's like nah throw me over to see with my ancestors which was cool but also it marked his inability to say, I can let this go, I can move past this, because no one here actually had anything to do with the thing that caused me pain. Right. Um, right. Most motivational for me, I love, love, love the part where um, it was it was Wakabi and Akoye standing yeah. there in front of the rhinoceros, and she <laughs> said, <Yeah. laughs> She says, would you kill me, my love? She says, for Wakanda, without question. Um, I am at a, and that, I, I made that into a shirt, the white one hanging on the lamp. It says, for Wakanda, without question. Um, but I think that for me in particular, just because of where I'm at in life, um, it's important to understand that what you're loyal to and the things that matter to you, they cannot alter because of a partner. Um, and for her, her entire identity was involved in being this warrior, this fierce warrior, and she's this fierce warrior and the leader for a reason. And that doesn't mean falter because of something else. So um, for me, that was, I was like, you, you go. Yeah. <laughs> he dropped his sword too. Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't think about inspirational, but kind of things that really stuck with me. Um, a lot of the ancestral connection and the moments where, um, both T'Challa and, and, and I want to call him Njikata, and I want to call him K Killmonger. We're able to um, interface with the ancestral realm. I found that really um, powerful. Um, I, in particular, was um, struck by the second time um, T'Challa was able to go to the ancestral realm and he body checked his ancestors. And so one of the things that I feel like we do sometimes is we, um, we don't want to speak ill of the dead. I know as, as, as black folk, as southern folk, you don't want to speak ill of the dead. And so what that means sometimes is that we don't allow ourselves actually to engage in that kind of um, emotional interrogation that allows us to heal what we would consider generational trauma because we don't want to talk about granddaddy being an asshole. And so, or, you know, somebody um, engaging in other activities that were even more violent or detrimental to the family that we carry with us um, as a part of epigenetics and blood memory. So I think that him being able to go back and his father being like, you can stay with us. And he was like, well, first off, can we just talk about what you did? <laughs> like, that was grimy. Like, that was really grimy, dad. And like, all of y'all over here, we gotta fix this. <laughs> That was not okay. And so um, I think that that's a very powerful message in terms of like, what does it mean for us to be able to provide healing um, for ancestral wounds and um, also to elevate your ancestors. And so um, as a, uh, a practitioner and a, an initiated priest in a traditional African um, religion, uh, part of the tradition in terms of ancestor veneration or um, worshiping your ancestors is that you do get to elevate them. Like you recognize the fact that like in life there were limitations and decisions that were made and that part of that kind of constant relationship um, with your ancestors allows for that to be elevated in a way. So I, I really like that. I also like that Ramonda um, is, is a priest. Like, so when they were, when they had made their way to the Jabari tribe and there was no technology 21st century technology available. She went to the technology of her priesthood and she was able to save her son. He's not really her son, y'all know that, right? And Yami is his mother. So we just, we're not gonna go all the way into, like, but the fact that that is like, Ramonda was able to heal her child because she's a priestess. And so she was able to tap into the technology of her priestly walk and she knew what to do. She didn't have to be told what to do. She didn't have to be told how to prepare the herb. She didn't have to be told how to bury him or to make the prayers. She, she pulled that technology that, was, that existed inside of her body and she used that technology to heal him. And then the piece that was kind of challenging for me was the, why did um, Njikata kill his girlfriend? Yeah. Mm, yeah. She was like, I'm sorry. He was like, pal. I was like, what? <laughs> so I was confused by that. Like it just left me like going, what happened? And then I was also um, confused by the invisibilizing of his mother. 
Where's his mama? But Disney does that. Yeah. So the fact, you know, we have to remember this is a That's Disney movie. Mama. You know, their MO is to kill your mama. Your mama just disappears. Like she what happened to her? She got caught in the fire. She fell in a hole. She ate a poison apple. Shit went down. So I'm just trying to figure out, like in Oak Town, in Oakland, what happened to his mother? Like Eric, what happened to Eric's mama? In Oakland. So I just wanted to know that, and I feel like it's important for us to, to talk about the um, importance of the mothering, right? So I feel like not only did he lose his father, but there was some kind of separation from his mother that also added to the trauma that, that led to some of that decision making that he was making once he arrived in Wakanda. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll start with Jay. Um, one of my favorite scenes in the movie was the scene where, hi Iris. <laughs> where, um, the scene where you have uh, T'Challa and his friend and ok Okoyo comes on, on their wristband. And when she comes up, she says, my king and my love. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about that scene is that as the strong warrior who is, the strong warrior who is, um, a symbol of strength throughout the movie, she's also able to show a loving side of herself in the duality in, in her character. So I really enjoyed that part of the movie. Um, I also found uh, some problems with the, the character of Eric in the movie. When I thought about who I identify with as a young African American, I think I identify the most with Killmonger because he's coming from the hood, he's coming from a single parent home, He's looking for, he's a lost boy who's mm -hmm. looking for his identity and looking for comfort. And what was problematic to me that, what was problematic for me is that no one came to him with open arms. Mm -hmm. No one showed him any love. He was immediately seen as an enemy. Mm -hmm. And it was very problematic for me um, when uh, the CIA agent says about Kilmonger, he's one of ours. Mm -hmm. That line really bothered me um, because as we talk about, you know, the colonizer and the colonized mind, you know, I, I just feel like it's, it's very problematic to, to call a villain the person who's colonized. Mm -hmm. so. um, I'll start off with the positive. Um, it's actually two things. The one thing that I, I really appreciated was the range of black, oh, the range of black womanhood. Literally, it was not the stereotypical, it's just one fits everyone. Yeah. To see a black, fierce woman who just happens to be a warrior, dope. And then seeing a very, it's beyond intelligence that Shuri is. She's just, Shuri is amazing. Shuri is technically my sister. My sister is a PhD physicist. And she's young. And to see that on film, that in itself is a miracle. My sister tells the stories of how she was the only woman in her class but then the only black woman. And the challenges, rather it was microaggression or mainly they were just straight, bold in their ignorance toward her. So that's the second part of what I found amazing that, and I, I don't wanna use this word, but they allowed a black woman to show the amount of intelligence. Mm -hmm fiercely and engage for all the right purposes in getting a colonizer together. I just love that. <laughs> and the thing about it, just like with, I don't want to say his name, Killmonger, with Eric, it was justified that you found the relevance between those two characters. You saw yourself within those two, those two characters who were very, on both sides of the, um, the polls. As far as what I did not like about the movie was the fact that Eric's rage, and it was sheer rage that he had, and you said it before, um, 
the mother, where was the mother, where was the family? If you remember, every scarification that was on his body equaled a kill. And if you're saying literally his whole body was covered, he was embodied with the kills that he produced as the um, almost a a medicinal purpose for his rage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when he came mm -hmm. and he said, "Hey, Auntie," mm -hmm. it was, "Hey, Auntie, <laughs> I'm putting y'all on check." Mm -hmm. But then. I am the embodiment of what you refuse to heal right. as my community. That's right. You better and say that. that. She did that. She did that. Right. You better say that. And the thing about <laughs> Eric is every person that we see walking around with pure rage in this moment. And it was very unresolved what happened to Eric. And my hope is that they do resolve it, because I'm going to say he's going to come back. <laughs> so they can get it right. And this is the last thing. The only other thing that bothered me about the movie, I really wanted to know why Ramonda, why Angela Bassett didn't show who she was. She a black mama. I wanted to see her kick some ass. That's what I wanted to see. <laughs> Because if it's in Africa and somebody comes after your child, yes, you want clear house. That's all I want to say. Let mom take care. It is a true story. So, what I found inspirational about the movie is the big one. inspirational about the movie was so when the movie premiered um, the, the venue I work for we did this big Black Panther event so you've got this theater full of black brown faces they're all dressed in African garb or cosplay they're all just kind of fellowshipping with each other and we all sit down we're all preparing for the movie people are still cracking jokes because we're black um, <laughs> but we're sitting in the movie now the first thing that I noticed was this beautiful well done opening that they they just cracked open the history of, of Wakanda and Black Panther in less than two minutes. And it was the most beautiful thing I've ever and even was saying I don't there's something, I don't know what that the earth, I don't there's a connection there. But they did it with sand. Um, and we're sitting there, we're watching the movie mm -hmm. and then to child of Kel Okoye, mm -hmm. they're flying over Africa and they break the tree line mm -hmm. and Wakanda appears. Mm -hmm. And y'all, I had I had emotional I had emotions about the movie just because of what it was. But to see it go from this kind of rural, rural just trees and giraffes, or whatever they had out there, and then you just reach this space into this most advanced technological city in the world, I literally cried. I was sitting in that theater, and that was the first time because I cried five times. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time. I was like. Am I this emotional right now? There was something just really powerful about see. You hear about it. We heard about it up until the premiere. But seeing that, seeing what we could have did with our colonization. Mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of broke my heart at the same time, but it made me very, very happy. Mm -hmm. um, the most problematic thing I've seen. Okay, so everybody, everybody has this like real emotional positive connection to Eric, and I don't. And it could be because I like villains. I like everything about them. I like the fact that they're jacked up in the head. Mm -hmm. And even though Eric's jacked upness came from trauma, he was still batshit crazy to him, right? <laughs> so Eric shows up. Well, let's, let's pretend that we don't know that Eric's got a point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Eric shows up. He's got an attitude. He's covered in marks. That he's bragging that he's killed all these people. He shows up, he's being smart, he's got an attitude. And he goes, okay, well, I got this tattoo, I've got this ring, I have a vibe with, uh, whatever he said uh, when, they asked, when he was trying to get, um, when the child was trying to stop them from asking who he was, mm -hmm. and he yelled it out. That's the only proof that they had. They had three pieces of proof that this man had 
claim to the throne. And what do they do? They give him the challenge anyway. They didn't, they didn't interrogate him. They didn't, they didn't ask him no DNA test. <laughs> this is no more nothing. This is the most advanced city in the world. Y'all can't tell me y'all can't do no bone scan and no nothing. No, we're just going to make him fight our king. <laughs> Somebody. So you got this nation that's built on tradition, you got this faith nation built on laws, and they literally almost let it destroy them. Mm -hmm. So that's what was problematic about me. He and his ass should have been in jail. No. Drop that little thing. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. Let's give it up for the panelists. So my next question is this, it's tell us all about your work, tell us all about your work, and um, how has the women of Wakanda in the movie impacted you or, or reminded you of something? Um, and, and then talk about, I mean, well, let me just kind of rephrase it. So, Talk about your work. Tell us about your work and how the women of Wakanda impacted you. Both women who we know are behind the scenes and actually on the screen. So we're going to start with Dare again and we'll pass the mic. Okay, so my work, I am an artist. I am, this is my piece. Those are my pieces. Um, my pieces are over there as well. Um, so for me, the importance of having women as these strong figures is something that's almost expected. Um, I was raised by a single mother. That's my mom over there. Hey, 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 Um, so, so I call her Captain Mom, and she's my right hand. She's my best friend. She's my rider, y'all. Um, and that being the case, it's like my, my whole world was surrounded by other strong women, um, or it was built around these other strong women. So for me, this expectation that women were the strong ones is just part of my understanding. Um, and a lot of my work, it's very, very women-heavy, um, and it focuses around those women as healers, as the burden carriers, as the soothers, as the nurturers, as the, as the wise ones. Um, and so seeing these women be portrayed in this way is kind of reaffirmation that this is something, like looking at everyone's reaction to this being something that they've never seen is validation that I need to keep doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that, you know, okay, I, I created this objective to create positive and magical imagery of people of color. Um, and I created two children's books out of that. They're actually over there as well. But the objective with those is to show little brown babies that, you know, the idea of the black family um, of a support system is not a myth, you know, it's not a unicorn, it's something that exists. Um, and in the same sort of way, you have black women, I think there's this understanding that they're strong, but I think there needs to be just this repeated thing where it's like if you Google something and you only see one or two results, then you're like, okay, maybe it's not real, but if you see 500 results, you know it is real. So this is one of the 500 for, for the women of Wakanda. It's something where it's not just the, okay, maybe they were strong. It's like, no, they were strong and there's no question of it and they were strong because of themselves. Um, it, it didn't take them saying, okay, we're in a situation to show their colors. Their colors were out the whole time. Yeah, art on the wall. <laughs> yes, the art on the wall. So behind us, right over here, and back by Mama. There you go. I'm a Mama too. I had to give shout outs to Mama. I'm like, hey, Mama. So, um, hey, Auntie. Hey, Auntie. So the work that I do. Um, so the work I do is, is liberatory work, right? So I've been doing work around the liberation of black folk since I was in third grade. Um, somebody started paying me to do it about 24 years ago. 
because um, I always use my oldest son, who'll be 26 next week, as a line of demarcation of like how long I've been um, pulling a paycheck to, to do what I feel like is an ancestral imperative. And I think the women of Wakanda, I can see so many of the people that I throw down with who do organizing work, um, who do movement building, who do a social justice work, like, like manifestations of them throughout the film, right? Um, you have people who are boots on the ground, organizers who throw down every day in these streets, and I can see that as the Dora Milaje, right? Like, this is what we do. We're clear about what we do. We have a role that we play, and we're dedicated to that role, and we're badass in our role, right? You know, you have folk who are strategists, you have folk who are tacticians, you have folk who are healers. Um, you have folk who are representatives of the tribes um, who come together to try to figure out collectively what are we going to do to move um, towards liberation in a way where we all can get their whole, you know? So I feel like um, seeing the different um, types of women in the movie, I really appreciated that. Um, as someone who is moving into her 51st um, birthday in a couple of months. And she's the word. Uh, <laughs> I've been talking a lot about decolonizing the chrome, right? Um, and so I think that we also see manifestations of um, powerful, strong women who are mature women, right? in this movie, right? So as much as we see Shuri in her youthfulness, um, in her clear genius, um, there's also much strength that we see in the, the eldership of the women who are also in the movie. And one of the elder actresses who's in the movie, this was her first kind mm -hmm. of major motion picture movie. Mm -hmm. Yes, and she started acting when she was in her 80s, yeah. right? So I feel like it's a very powerful statement around your ability to reinvent yourself. I think that black women have always been shapeshifters. Um, and so I think that the different ways that we see that manifest in the movie really resonates with me because I have shapeshifted um, from daughter to mother to mother to partner to partner, all the different things that I kind of do in, in community. And so I, I really, really felt that in the movie. And um, I have tried to move away from a warrior um, identity into more of a healer home identity, and that's been a challenge for me. Um, and so I, I'm thinking a lot about the ways that what will happen in the next film, right? Because we know that T'Challa does not marry Nakia, y'all. You know, I'm just like, I just, I, I, you know, I'm like, once again, Ramana's not his mama. He does not marry Nakia. You gotta read the comics. You gotta read the comics. You know, so you have the, you know, the, you're, and you're, you gotta know what happens. You gotta know what happens. But the beautiful thing about what happens, I think, in the Marvel Universe is that there is always this constant power of reinvention, right? Always this constant power of regeneration, reinvention, the choice to come back, the choice to evolve, the choice to let go, the choice to shift, shape shift from what might be perceived as villainous, which I don't, I, 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 I take issue with the word villain and think more of an antagonist or an anti-hero, right? So it's like, I think that's what you're actually seeing is somebody who's just like very resistant to um, convention, right? And so then the only way we want to describe it is villainous. That's, I'm not talking about my work anymore, I'm just blurted out. Um, so I, I blurted out in front of y'all, I'm sorry. <laughs> So I'm gonna pass it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she said, pull it back, pull it back. So, um, I guess I'll start by claiming that I'm a writer, claiming that um, this year has been about doing a lot of creative writing for me. I'm currently in graduate school and um, my work is around science fiction and right. creative writing. Um, I consider myself to be an Octavia Butler scholar. I claim that completely. No one claimed, put that on me by myself. Um, I read all of her novels and am currently working on a story on her life um, and turning her life into a science fiction story. Um, oh, sorry. Um, also, um, 
I think a part of my work is uh, as an educator, before um, starting my master's, I um, taught K through 12. Um, I've taught adult high school, I've taught GED, and a part of what I wanna do right now is take the knowledge that I'm learning in the university and translate that to my people because if the knowledge that I'm getting is not turned into action, mm -hmm. then it's not real knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, sister. My work, um, my work, well, I wrote it down on the card, so let me. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and read it. Read it. You better be prepared. Be prepared. I got notes. <laughs> I call myself an emerging so uh, social multimedia documentarian, bringing analog narratives to digital multiverses. Oh, really? That's what we're going to do? <laughs> that's what we're going to do. That's, that's what, what we're gonna really going to do. Right. And <laughs> the thing about it is this movie has impacted me and the fact that I keep myself very hidden, very low key. Like, she's shaking her head because she knows me. Um, in being so in the background, though, I'm very keen on watching, observing people's narratives, and it fascinates me. And it wants to come forth in allowing someone else's narrative to go through my artwork. I consider myself a vessel. Mm. And as a vessel, especially in this broken world, mm -hmm. there are so many narratives that is not being spoken mm -hmm. because it doesn't fit this way, it doesn't mm -hmm. advertise this way, mm -hmm. doesn't move this way. Well, who is you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because the thing about it is the most powerful narratives that I've ever heard are from people who are never seen. Mm -hmm. And so I want to use my artwork, rather it's through social media, Omni76, um, or through talking to people and sharing the narratives that I've heard and then people share their narratives with me and then I go pass it on to other people. Narratives, just like in Black Panther, save people. Mm. A narrative could have saved Eric. A narrative actually saved T'Challa, meaning if it wasn't for the story of Eric, it would not have literally and figuratively challenged T'Challa to become the Black Panther. Wow. So if that can happen in film, I want it to happen in real life through my work. Wow. All right. All right. All right. All right. I remember when I met you, it was at Black Market, and you had a camera. <laughs> Yo, that, that was first, me. That was me. Walked up, he was like, can I film you? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. um, what I do, um, I'm a writer. Um, I'm an aspiring uh, filmmaker. Um, I am a shower singer. Uh, my CDs are... <laughs> No. Oh. <laughs> Everybody look! <laughs> That's I'm, I'm so done. I, I'm I so done. Shady. SoundCloud. But, um, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> side note, side note. Are we ever going to get Claus's uh, mixtape? Yeah. Is anybody prepared? No. Yeah. no. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that in a couple of weeks. Okay, because I want it. I want to see what you're talking about. Okay, so. so back to me. Um. So yeah, I am a writer, um, science fiction, Afrofuturism, uh, fantasy. Um, I, ha I make it a point in my writing to, and this pisses, this pisses the publishers and agents off, but I make it a point to make every character in my books people of color. Woo, y'all do not know how angry <laughs> that makes publishers. And, and they say really outrageous, racist things to me, and I was like, I don't care. I'm not changing. So, that's, that's my goal, is to make sure that in this, this field where you don't see a lot of black faces, you don't see people of color in Afrofuture, I mean not Afrofuture, but science fiction and, and fantasy, you don't see those faces. Um, I want to make sure that I am so almost overbearing with it that you can't help 
but question why we haven't seen these faces before. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to do that with the film thing, but I'm, I'm baby steps. So one day y'all see a film doing the things that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But until then, read my books. <laughs> What's the title? Oh, <clears throat> the title. The title <laughs> of the book. Of the book. Come on. Not have it. Um, the title of the book. The is title of the book is the Halo of Amorous. The Halo of, of Amorous. How is Amorous spelled? Ooh, A A M E R I S. That's what A M A R I S. A M A. R I S. The title of the book is The Halo of Amorous by J. Brienne. And that's B R I E. Come on. A. N N E. Let's get up for this round of responses to yes. people. We're winding down to the first half of our conversation. We're going to take a dance break, a cocktail break, an opportunity to go and visit Dare's table where those books that she wrote and her art is available, as well as an opportunity to go by and see Joy from Joy's Workings tarot readings. I've seen quite a few of you go and have certain things uh, affirmed about yourself and we encourage you to do that all night. Uh, a lot of things that come up when, as I'm listening to your responses. So we're talking about a few things. We're talking about representation. We're talking about identity. Mm. We're also talking about with, uh, well, grappling with those two things. But we're also talking about um, juxtaposition. Uh, how there were quite a few things that were there and then subtly not there at the same time. And that was on purpose. So I want to uh, start out with the next question. I want y'all to be thinking about those things, first of all, for the second round. But um, I'm gonna ask these two questions. So here we go. What would you add to the film? Mm. Or what aspect of the film would you like to see develop more? And I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it there. So again, what would you add to the film or what aspect of the film would you like to see develop more? Based on who you are. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, maybe we should bring it around over, the back. Over your back. Yeah, bring it around the back. That way. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, what did I want to see develop more? Well, one, I wanted there to be actual sexual tension between T'Challa and Nakia and not a boy crush. No, I really did. Like, I wanted them to have sex. Like, um, cause they're grown. They're grown. And so I was like, so this is your ex-girlfriend that you, you start doing the stuff, you like dutta man when she walk in the room. So I need there to be some heat. Right, so I really wanted there to be a lot more sexual tension between the two of them. Um, I also wanted to know more of the background of Ramonda. Like, it, who are your people? Who's your tribe? Are you related to Storm? Storm, your people? Like, was that a prelude to that relationship? Um, I also wanted more backstory on Enchicada and his mother. Um, and I, I wanted to see more of his childhood, like like what was he like as a baby, right? Like what what was the transition that had his mother exit his life? What did he learn from his father, right? Like what happened when he actually went into that closet and he found that book and his father like, planted these things about his um, lineage for him to find. So I wanted to know like how much time did he actually get to spend with his father talking about his lineage. Um, and I also wanted to know more about the four tribes, right? So why the tribes um, were wearing particular colors, why they had certain animal totems, um, their ability to do certain things. So I just was very interested in, in wanting that. But the thing that, that just kind of kept coming back to me is like I wanted for there to be much more real 
sensual sexual tension between T'Challa and, and Nakia and for that to play itself out. I know they're not. They're not meant to be. <laughs> um, that's kind of interesting because it kind of leads to what I wanted to see more of. I was very interested in, I mean, for those of you that don't know, there's been several versions of Black Panther. This is one of many. Um, and I was interested to know why none of the characters or, or from the past movies were in this movie, for instance. You mentioned Storm earlier. In 2010, BET came out with an animated version of Black Panther where Jill Scott plays Storm. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, we were talking about De Dejamon Hansu, mm -hmm. who was the voice of Black, Black Panther, Panther in that BET um, series. And so I just wondered, you know, Kerry Washington was also in that. So I just wondered about actors in the past, sorry, actors in the past who've been, you know, instrumental in Black Panther. Um, Wesley Snipes was another actor back in like 1996. He was interested in Black Panther. But none of those actors um, and celebrities were a part of the current movie. And so I kind of wondered, you know, what kind of led to Marvel just scrapping all the old people and coming up with a completely new cast. Um, yeah, I think that was something that really came to mind for me. For me, I want to see, I hope to see more Wakanda in the Afrofuturistic sense. Meaning that I want to see how dope it is to have a mountainscape, but then how the vibranium affects that. Because whatever is in the soil affects the environment, it creates the atmosphere. And to see Shuri in her lab and seeing how much you see this beautiful push and pull of technology with Africanness, it was dope. But I want to see the cities. I want to see like what the skylines look like. Is it purple? Like, is there literally a pulse that goes from the people to the environment? Mm. It, yeah, it does Not in the comics. Yeah. And I, I really want Hannah, I'm calling you by your first name, like I know you girl, mm -hmm. Hannah Bleacher, who is the production designer, really push the limits in her bringing that essence of these incredible environments that we saw sketches of. Mm -hmm. I really want to see what a Wakanda beach looks like. Mm -hmm. I really want to see how the sun sets mm -hmm. in Wakanda. Mm -hmm. I really want this mythical place to become real. Mm -hmm. I think we're all in agreement that we want to see more of Wakanda. Um, and I'm in agreement too. Um, I think that with something, and I know it's new, but it's, at the same time it's not. Um, and you're gonna find a lot of people who don't have the patience, who don't have the patience to actually read the comics. So there's gonna to have to be a way that we do this through the movie. Um, and I fully, ex not expect, I demand that we treat Black Panther like we treat Star Wars. Mm. If anybody knows about Star Wars, it has a very, very large expanded universe. There's books, there's comics, mm -hmm. there's side shows and, and all, all this kind of stuff. You can go onto Wikipedia right now and <laughs> you will be there for an entire year before you get to the next subject. That's how rich the information bases, and I want them to give us so much of Wakanda, and so much of this royal family, and so much of this of this world that we all become experts. Mm -hmm. I want I want there to be no shame when we show up to the movie theater in mass in our cosplay because there's so it, the popularity is so there, and there's so much information that people have just taken into themselves about this land, and they're gonna have to do that by giving us more Wakanda. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I want so much of it. I want background stories. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want fanfic. Look, I, I said this on Twitter. If there are people here who write fanfiction, if, and if you know what that is, you're gonna nod. Mm -hmm. Send it to me, mm -hmm. I will read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious, I need it. I will give you my email address. Um, yes, send it. <laughs> 
So what she's saying, if you know someone who writes fan fiction and they write the sex scene, like, no. let her know. No. <laughs> so. yes. Thank you for saying that, Dare. Absolutely. Word. So there's that. There's that. There's that. So I wanted to say to that last comment or response, well, I already responded to that before that, give us us free, but we also get to reclaim that because we get to create our own realities. And that's something, that's one of the reasons why we're here is to rem remember that we get to create our own realities and we get to free ourselves by mastering ourselves. So I, I like what you said. Um, I also, before we go into the break, there's one more question I'm gonna ask that we take 30 seconds to answer the question, um, perhaps with the character and maybe one word, a, a one word explanation as to why you would choose that character. So we're gonna get into that um, in just a second, but I wanna just recap on that particular question because it, responses, all of the responses have been great, but uh, wow. Um, so one of the things I got from, uh, again, the last response was give us us free by watching Amistad and how uh, this was as much English as, as that character could speak, but he knew how to say that. And um, I'm a foreign language, a former, well, actually I'm a current foreign language teacher. And so uh, that moment was really significant to me because uh, he used the little that he knew, that he picked up on through intuition to be able to say something really powerful. And so um, that's what I thought about. I also want to talk about what you said in terms of, I want to see a sex scene. <laughs> and, and that goes along with representation because oftentimes we're not seeing black people. Let me just say black people. Mm -hmm. And it may not be something that you can understand, which is why we're here too, having this conversation. Unless we acquiesce to what we consider white culture or white supremacy, um, we're not considered human. And even in, 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 even in, in, in those ways, we, we're not supposed to enjoy sex. We're not supposed to talk about it. We're not supposed to be tired. We're not supposed to complain. Uh, because we're, we're, we, we feel like robots and we consider us, or oh, we've been programmed oftentimes to be robots. And so I think that is really important to think about in terms of development because we should see people having sex in a movie in a way that's humanistic. We're not looking for pornography. We're looking for real representation. That is important. So thank you for making that statement. Uh, because a lot of us aren't brave enough to say something like that right now. So yes, absolutely. Uh, new cast. Um, one of the things I hear over and over and over um, about that in terms of the comic books, um, art, and we talked about this last night a little bit in the last few days, how art is um, always an interpretation and how we all have an interpretation and how each of our interpretations are powerful. So what I was really excited about um, was that this was an interpretation that I was not aware of. It was completely, well, kind of completely new for me. There were some small nostalgic moments from reading comic books, but not very many. Would y'all agree with that in terms of the comic books? Okay. Um, and so I saw it as a, a raw interpretation and I was okay with it. Uh, I would like to see the directors and the writers incorporate some of those things. I would love to see some of Roxane Gay's work incorporated on film uh, because her work and her writing is out of sight. And it was one of the things that drew some of these other authors to this particular work. During a time, again, because I'm talking about black folk, when you talk about black folk and black people, sometimes people don't want to touch it. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily want to touch it because of the, 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 the things that we've experienced in terms of not being considered as human as everybody else, in terms of being creative, in terms of being writers, in terms of, all, of being all those things. So that was also really powerful to me. Um, Shuri in the lab. 
I don't want to be a whole tap up here. Uh -oh. So I won't be. But I, <laughs> I won't be. But I do want to say, you know, in terms of technology, it started in Africa. There's a period on that sentence. Oh, Y'all can snap it up and clap it up and all that for that. Because it started in Africa and there's a period on that. And that's not good, it's not bad, it's just it's is period. what it is. It started in Africa. And I'm talking to you as a woman who has experienced generations and generations and generations of psychological trauma telling me that I'm not who I know I am. And it's a daily battle. So I don't hesitate to say, it started in Africa period. with a period yep. on the sentence. And so my last question is. <laughs> 30 seconds, each person, one character and one word describing why. Who was the hero of this film wow. for you. Wow. 30 seconds. She said absolutely not. <laughs> that was my that was my Nigerian that was for you, Dare. Uh so I, what I wrote down, but I'll have 30 seconds, is I actually felt like it was a combination of Nakia and Mbaku, actually, because I, I like Nakia um, because she is um, more wedded to principle than institutions. And so that meant that she was willing to break with tradition if that meant that her values are gonna be thrown out the window. And Mbaku, um, ironically, for the same reasons, um, that he was a man of principle and he knew that he was gonna do the right thing even if he said he wasn't going to help. He ended up helping because it was a, a man of principle. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like the human mm -hmm. quality of that. So I would say um, favorite character is um, Okoye. Um, she, yes. Is, yes. <laughs> she is my yes. favorite. She is consistent. Um, her strength, her love, um, like I said earlier, her ability to, you know, to be dual, to, you know, to love her man, to love her country, to, to love her king. And um, one, one, another one of my favorite parts of the movie is when Nakia um, asks her to come with the queen and the princess. And she says, no, my loyalty is to the throne. And so that to me shows that, you know, her strength and her loyalty is in her, is in her kingdom and in her love for her country and her community. And I'm just gonna piggyback off of that. Um, Okoye, when she said, my love, I honestly thought she was talking about Wakanda. She wasn't talking about dude. She was looking at him, but he's just a representation of her, you know, her country. She's talking about Wakanda. Every time that she talks or she's challenged, it's Wakanda, Wakanda, Wakanda. So for me, I loved T'Challa, but it was really Okoye. Like, yeah. she represented, she's a general for a reason. Mm -hmm. She is the person that outside of the king, she is the next that the people will follow her lead. Notice I said her. Thank you. Um, <laughs> period. Period. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So the definition of a hero is someone who faces danger and makes personal sacrifices. That means that everybody in Black Panther was a hero. Yay. Every last one of them, except for the colonizers. One of them, he kind of helped, but it was kind of like, he didn't really like. So if you look at each and every character, you'll see their motivations. Even if they're twisted, they are all for the love of Wakanda. They are all for the love of black people. So you can't really villainize anyone. Even though some, even though Eric. <laughs> Damn it. He, he still, his motivations made, were heroic. So everybody, all of them, heroes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then to follow that,
that. Unfortunately, I'm gonna pick one and I'm actually gonna say Zuri uh, because, and my one word is truth. Um, he, of course, it was, it was a brutal way in which it came out, but his truth allowed, one, it allowed the plot to develop, but there was a serious commitment when, when he yelled, he said, I'm your king now. It was not just the, okay, let me tell you what this dude said. It was, okay, I owe you this, but it was, one, the truth that he held, but two, he allowed things to change. All right. Well, all right. Let's give it up for yeah. the women of the Wakanda family. Yes. Yeah. So now we're going to take a break and listen to a little bit more of the Black Panther soundtrack. There is an opportunity again for you to get more of the heart shaped herb drink. It's purple, y'all. <laughs> The Wakanda sunset, because I felt what you said in terms of, I want to know what it looks like too. Tonight, it looks like a drink over there at the bar. Cheers. And I will say, because it's Pisces season, and I'm Pisces, my birthday was last week, a week from now. So it is Wakanda sunset and purple. I'm sorry, heart-shaped herb time. So that's how it's gonna be until Pisces meeting is over. And I will say the Wakanda sunset looks real good. Right over there at the bar. Aaron, who is my birthday twin. There you go. And Heather, who's not my birthday twin, but she, she is Pisces too. So when I tell you they, they know what they're doing back there behind the bar, Trust, trust the women in the building tonight. Also, speaking of trusting the women in the, in the building tonight, Joy, Joy's working over there with the tarot cards. This place is called Arcana. That's Love 22 over there that Joy is giving you. Go and get a reading. Also, over at Derek Holter's table, there are two children's books. Is that my understanding? There are t-shirts, there are prints, there are amazing things happening. And her mother, in true mama support, is over there womaning the table and waving. And she has a smile on her face. And she is receiving you as guests tonight. Please support the women in the building tonight. We'll be back in 15 minutes. Dance, shout, say hello to somebody you don't know. Say hello to somebody you do know. And let's have a good time tonight. Let's be together. Hey, sure.
Yeah, that was, that was 